Representative Jones, uh, if you can hear me, I appreciate it. Um, was this in your mind about the violation of decorum rules last week, or is this about something else? I know, this is something much more egregious. Um, today, Tennessee expelled us, myself, and, and Representative Pearson, uh, the two youngest black lawmakers, a predominantly white Republican supermajority, because we stood with our constituents, these young people you see gathered here, who are demanding that they act to end school shootings. That's why we're being expelled, not because of a crime, not because of an ethics violation, but because we stood with these young people who are demanding that we act to end these school shootings a week after Nashville was terrorized by a school shooting at Covenant Elementary School. And rather than address the issue of banning assault weapons, my former colleagues, um, the Republican supermajority, are assaulting democracy, and that should change, you know, that should scare all of us across the nation. The Tennessee State House Speaker, uh, Cameron Sexton, he likened your behavior during the protest last week to the January 6th insurrection. I just want to play that for our viewers and then ask you about it. Two of the members, Representative Jones and uh, Representative Johnson, have been very vocal about January 6th in Washington, D.C., about um, what that was. And what they did today was equivalent, at least equivalent, maybe worse, depending on how you look at it, of doing an insurrection in the Capitol. Was what you did worse than or equivalent to the insurrection in the Capitol? I mean, it is a completely ridiculous statement from Representative um, um, Speaker Sexton to that, that is trying to incite a reaction. What we were doing was the opposite. We were calling for the end of, of violence. We were standing with our constituents, demanding that we take action on gun violence in our community, because this is not the la first um, mass shooting in Nashville, and it won't be the last until this body acts. So we stood with our people, demanding that the legislators um, take the grievances of these young people. You hear the chance going on right now. People want action from this body, and until they get it, we'll continue to show up and hold this legislature accountable, whether I'm inside the body or outside the body here in the hallway. Do you regret at all doing what you did? I mean, obviously, you could have stood outside with demonstrators and made your point. The fact is you were doing this on, on the House floor with a bullhorn, and it is probably a violation of the rules of decorum. Do you regret it at all? Was there some other punishment that would have been acceptable to you? No, I mean, this came after the speaker shut off our microphones when not called on us as Democratic lawmakers to speak. And so it was our only way to uphold our constitutional duty. Um, Tennessee Constitution, Article 2, Section 27, says that lawmakers have a right to dissent from and protest against any action or legislation that's injurious to the people. And so while I broke the House rules, I upheld my oath to my constituents, 78,000 constituents in, in my district, District 52, many of them these young people here who are demanding that we act and demanding that we do something. And that we needed to say that on the House floor. We needed to make sure that those young people, their voices, their demands, their grievances were held and were heard on the House floor. I didn't go there as an individual. I went there as a representative of 78,000 people for District 52. And that's why I went to the well, demanding that my colleagues act on this crisis of mass shootings that is plaguing our nation. Representative Gloria Johnson, your Democratic colleague, who, who stood with you, protested with you last week, was not expelled today. She survived by one vote. Did that surprise you? Why do you think she survived? I mean, it was, it, was, it was surprising, but, we, you know, we are united. As, as, as Representative Gloria Johnson said, I mean, the only difference is our skin color. And I think we have to be honest about that. Um, that, again, this predominantly white Republican supermajority is expelling the two youngest black lawmakers because we stood with young people demanding that this body act. And so um, we still stand united together. But what happened today is, is, is threatening not just the Tennessee, but across the nation, this, this, this usurping of the Democratic, you know, voters' will of my district, of silencing of 78,000 people in my district, the most diverse district in the state of Tennessee. I mean, it's very scary for the nation to see what's happening here. And if I didn't know that it was happening to me, I would think that this was 1963 instead of 2020, uh, 2023. Personally, what do you do now? Would you run for your seat in the next election? Uh, is there another election to be held? There's a step to fill the vacancy that the council, the Metro Council, National Council will have to address. There's also going to be a special election. Um, but, you know, I'm looking at legal um, remedies because what I what I believe is that what happened here, and after talking to attorneys, I mean, it was unconstitutional. It was a violation of due process. It was an overturning of the will of voters, silencing of my district. The most extreme measure it to expel a member, not for an ethics or criminal violation, but because of a rule of decorum.
And so that's what we saw. And so again, it was what happened today was to distract from the real issue, which was that a week after mass shooting in Nashville, rather than pass laws to pass common sense gun laws, um, my colleagues expelled myself and Representative Pearson because they're afraid of, of what we are giving voice to, which are all these young people you see gathered around the Capitol, demanding this body change, Gen Z, millennials, saying that it's our time now and that we need substantive and urgent action to address this crisis of mass shootings. State Representative Justin Jones, I appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Joining us now, CNN senior political analyst Ron Brownstein. He's a uh, senior editor at The Atlantic, also uh, Audie Cornish, uh, who uh, is with us here at, uh, at CNN. So, Audie, uh, let's just regroup here a little bit. For, members, for folks who are just joining us, Justin Pearson, Justin Jones, Gloria Johnson, uh, all three took part in a protest on the House floor using bullhorns last week. Uh, they said they weren't being heard. They, their microphones were turned off, so they protested. It was a violation of the rules of decorum. Just today, there were votes to expel two of them. Um, and as we said, Gloria Johnson survived just by one vote. So explain, if you can, we were talking before this, I mean, what happens next here? Uh, well, what happens next is there are special elections for the two seats that were vacated. Already in Nashville, the Metro Council, which is the local government, um, is planning to uh, call a special meeting on Monday, and they do plan to sort of uh, reinvite um, uh, Mr. Jones, which you just heard, back um, to that seat. So in terms of the stakes, not that much has changed, but it, I really can't underscore enough how how significant the tensions are mm. between Nashville, this metropolitan area, mostly led by a Democratic kind of uh, council, has been kind of at odds with the Republican State House, and how, and Ron will talk about this, how that is really reflective of a trend that's going on across the country. Yeah, Ron, it is interesting, and we see this on election nights, you know, when John King is at the magic wall and mm. we're all waiting for votes. Right. It's, you know, big cities, uh, voting Democrat in states that are largely red. Yeah, Joe Biden won 91 of the 100 largest counties in America. And, you know, Donald Trump won 2,600 or so of the other 3,000. The dynamic you see in state after state uh, is Democrats, you could draw an imaginary beltway around every large metro in the country, and Democrats are consolidating their strength inside of that, and Republicans are strengthening their hand outside of it. But I think that what we are seeing in the red states, that that political pattern extends from blue, you know, it's as true in California as it is in Texas. But what we are seeing in red states is this systematic effort to use this statewide power to preempt the ability of those blue metros to make their own decisions and for, you know, uh, voters in those places to set their own course. The, you know, you're talking before about the generational uh, transition. In many of these states, the generational transition and the racial transition are completely overlapping. They are essentially uh, the same thing. I and mean, if you talk about places like Florida or Georgia or Texas or Tennessee or Arizona before they elected a governor, places where the preemption has been most powerful, generally speaking, you have a Republican coalition that is rooted in the older generations that are predominantly white in those states, and a Democratic coalition that is rooted in the increasingly diverse younger generations in those states. And what we see, not only on preemption, but on issues like LGBTQ rights and voting and abortion bans and book bans and classroom censorship, you see these Republican coalitions moving to impose on the states the values of their older white, predominantly Christian coalition before this demographic change possibly alters the balance of political power in their states. I've likened what's happening, Anderson, to these Republican legislatures are stacking sandbags uh, uh, against a rising tide of demographic change. And I think this is one of the most dramatic examples of that that we've seen anywhere in the country. Or do, you, do you think these protests will have an impact on the legislature there? I don't know if it will have an impact on the legislature, so to speak. I mean, it certainly brought more scrutiny on their activities. Um, but I also want to come back to a point uh, that, um, that Justin Jones said about Gen Z and millennials. They have entered the chat, so to speak. We're seeing this generation of um, activists start to enter 
the lawmaking process, just like the generations before them, some out of Fisk University, right, in Nashville in the mm. 60s who ended up being lawmakers. What's significant about that is they're a generation that watched Occupy Wall Street. They are a post-Trayvon Martin generation. They are a, a Black Lives Matter generation. And they are a kind of Parkland era generation. They think about gun policy and the politics around shootings differently. Their politics are more confrontational. And they really do feel as though this is their time to make a mark. And they're very media savvy. And I think that uh, Justin Jones, in a way, in particular, um, and Pearson, also from Memphis, they really embody kind of that mix of savvy and politics and approach to progressive politics that is distinct to this generation. Run, does, but Audie, does that, does that mean, I mean, on, on the, the, the protest that they, that they did, they clearly believe that they're, you know, they have the moral high ground. Um, it, it is difficult to legislate if members yeah, sure. of a representative, yeah. you know, if the representatives no, I, bring I, I understand on. what you're asking, but I think what I'm saying is that there is a generational preoccupation with decorum. Um, there is an era of what was called respectability politics. If you dress the right way, if you acted the right way, people would consider your politics serious and take you seriously. I think this generation thinks that that is not totally true. 